thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's program. I'm very excited. And I have the honor of introducing tonight's uh, moderator. Uh, so uh, Beth Carroll uh, uh, Horrocks is the head of special collections at the State Library of Massachusetts, which is in the Massachusetts State House. And she's worked there since 2011. So all uh, uh, 40 of us or so who are watching live on Zoom and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that we'll watch later on uh, on YouTube and elsewhere. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Beth. And Beth, thanks so much for doing this and for organizing this. Great. Well, thank you, Robert. The State Library of Massachusetts is delighted, actually more than delighted to partner with you, our colleagues at the Tewksbury Public Library again, and also the public libraries of Andover and Lowell for tonight's presentation by former state representative Kathleen Tian. The, the State Library holds Kathleen's papers. We're delighted to have them. And our author talk committee first worked with Kathleen in 2018, the year after her first book came out. And she spoke in person in the library reading room about her previous book, The Cookie Loved Round the World, which tells the story of the chocolate chip cookie from its invention in Whitman, which she represented, to its eventual designation as the official cookie of Massachusetts. It's pitched as a children's book, but the history and explanation of how legislation works make it relevant for adults too. So we, we had more current and former legislators at that event, at Kathleen's first talk with us, than we'd had for any other author talks, which I think tells you a lot about Kathleen and how she works. It was really fun to see so many legislators in the audience. So tonight, she'll talk about her new book, For the People Against the Tide, A Democratic Woman's 10 Years in the Massachusetts Legislature. And I have to say that as a librarian who works with manuscripts, rare books, and special format material, the uh, image on the front cover of all that water surrounding the State House uh, was, was a frightening sight. It's just on the cover of the book, so not in real life. So the book describes her life before she ran for the state legislature, her inspiration to run, her tenure there from 1997 to 2007, representing uh, the seventh Plymouth district, including Whitman, Abington, and East Bridgewater, her service on legislative committees that focused on issues of equal rights, quality education and access to health care and, and health issues. And then uh, her tenure after, the, her, her life after her tenure in the legislature and her continued advocacy for her constituents and for the greater community. So to give you a sense of how other elected officials see her, I'd like to read a, an excerpt from the tribute on the back cover of the book by former Governor Deval Patrick. This is a quote from Deval Patrick. As a persistent legislator and a careful listener, Kathy Tian brought her faith in our civic values and in people to our state, influencing jaundiced veteran politicians and wide-eyed newcomers alike, and giving a voice to the voiceless. Her memoir reminds us of the power of her optimism. So Kathleen, over to you. Thank you so much, Beth. Beth and Robert have been wonderful organizing this virtual talk today and I appreciate it very much. I also appreciate everything that happens at libraries. They give us so many services these days that we desperately need. And um, so thank you so much and may all the libraries continue to be successful forever. And as Beth mentioned, the um, tide on the front of my book, actually the big wave coming up the State House stairs and the title came from an award that I got from Healthcare for All for my work, especially on oral health to try to make oral health available to children at the beginning and to adults 
no matter what their income was, because the mouth is an important part of the body, as we all know. And um, so I had received that award and I, it's the only award that I have hanging in my cottage and it meant the most. But also I think that that um, tide coming up the state house steps signifies right now the climate change issues that we're dealing with. And it actually could happen because Boston is built on so many pilings and so much water, but we are very hopeful and I'm doing everything I can to make sure that um, we stop what's happening with climate change. But to get to my book, it's an honor to be here and to have this opportunity to talk to all of you and thank you for the people in the audience and especially um, thank you for the names that were familiar to me or people who I have worked with in the past and also nice and especially nice to have new people that I wish I could see, but I don't see at the moment. So thank you for the honor of being able to talk to you. And my 10 years in the legislature were definitely an honor. Every day that I worked there, I loved. My husband had told me that I would love it and I did love it. And I loved all the people I worked with and all the issues and all the people that I was trying to help. So that was an extreme honor. And I do hold an honor that I wish I didn't. And that honor is I'm one of 221 women that have served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives since its very beginning. Since it's the legislature since the very beginning and the Massachusetts Constitution was written and adopted in 1780. And since then, with the elections and workings of the legislature, there have been over 20,000 men and only 221 women. So that's a very poor showing. And I hope that that will continue to change because how can we have full representation when everyone doesn't have an equal seat at the table. And that goes for women, it goes for people of all races and colors, and it goes for all the LGBTQT community. So hopefully we'll be working towards changing those numbers, but thank you so much for having me. And to tell you a little story of the history of my book. I started writing this when I retired from the State House. I moved to my cottage in Howitchport, where I live now, and I wanted to get involved in the community and meet people. So one of the first things I did was to take a memoir class at Cape Cod Community College. And the name of it was from from memories to life stories. And so I decided to write about my days in the legislature thinking that um, maybe I would write a book sometime and hopefully educate people about what it takes to keep our democracy strong and how to get elected and just the importance of the, each position because of what you can do for people is really powerful. So I started and there were probably a dozen people in the class and they were mesmerized. They had no idea of how things worked and they were very interested and they kept telling me definitely, you know, work on getting this published. So when I had about eight chapters completed, I went to the Cape Cod Writers Center summer conference. And at that conference, you can pay $100 or so to talk to an agent about publishing your book and to get ideas from them what they think you need to improve. So the first year, I had a, an agent, and he thought it was really good and to keep on going and to put more personal um, stories in and make sure it was not just facts, but my perspectives, my experiences. So I started doing that. And then 
The next year, I talked to another agent and she said, well, people really aren't that interested in reading memoirs these days, but that chapter you have about the Troll House chocolate chip cookie could really be a bestseller. So because the Troll House chocolate chip cookie, which I don't know if you know this, but 7 billion of them are eaten in the United States every year. And most people, even though we all love it, don't know it was invented in my hometown of Whitman. And this is the Toll House restaurant, which started out as a really um, decrepit old house in 1930, when two young married people, Ruth and Ken Wakefield, had a dream of opening their own restaurant, which they did. And um, started out with seven tables and just four people there, including Ruth and her husband, one waitress and one guy to help with maintenance. So they made it into one of the best restaurants in America. And from all my research, um, I learned that it was in syndicated columns that Ernie Pyle wrote, he visited. Um, Duncan Hines and his wife came and it was written up in several books. Well. 1937 is when the cookie was invented at that restaurant because they ran out of walnuts. And um, Ruth looked around the kitchen and said, oh, what can we put in? And she chipped off some pieces of a giant block of semi-sweet chocolate, put them in the cookies. And um, it became the cookie. And when I filed the bill with Senator Tom Norton to make the chocolate chip cookie the official cookie. It wasn't my idea. It was my very first year in the House of Representatives. And I was a woman and I didn't want to be filing a bill about cookies, but we did it anyway, because Whitman was very excited. We did make it the official cookie. And um, so I kept busy doing that in publishing that book, the artwork took a long time. I was going to have my son do it, but he didn't want to make all the changes that would have been necessary. So I got this wonderful illustrator who helped out. And we put a lot in about the depression and about hunger because that was the whole environment that the cookie was invented in. So that took me a while. And that book was published in 2014. And um, I was having a good time doing author talks on that. But then as I kept seeing what was happening in our country and seeing how our very precious democracy was becoming more and more fragile, that um, Congress was pretty dysfunctional because people were more interested in being reelected than in doing good for the people and would not work together to come to solutions to the immigration issues, to the gun violence issues, to just um, so many things that we continue to see today. So I kept seeing that. And then I knew from even when I ran the issue of money in politics and then the um, Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court allowed so much dark money to go into politics and it became more and more difficult for an ordinary person to run and raise the money. So I kept seeing those things happening and then it just got worse and worse and we needed more transparency in both the state government and the federal government. We needed um, people who would stand up for the people's needs. So, so I got to work on my memoir again. I had Two wonderful people helped me. One person was Marjorie Turner Holman, who has written many books on um, easy walking trails. And she was my mentor and she helped me to stick with it and got me to um, question where I would need to put more information and you know, where, where maybe we didn't need all the information. So I would finally finish that and um, so it's done. And 
it starts out with how I became a state rep. So in the book, and it all happened in 1995, and actually a little before that, my husband, Bob Tien, whose career when we married was athletic director at high school and a football coach at the high school and semi-pro teams, and later um, as a scout for the Patriot, but, but Patriots, but he wanted to um, get involved in politics. So he ran in an election and won, and he did two terms, 1973 to 1976 and then decided knocking on doors and asking for votes and interrupting people who were at picnics and things was not his cup of tea. So then he went to work full time for the Patriots. So that's 1976 and we had our family and I did a lot of volunteer work in Whitman, which is the town I was born in. I had a good sized family in Whitman and I had been on the school committee I volunteered with my church doing um, Eucharistic Minister CCD program, volunteered in the schools, did Habitat for Humanity, outreach, um, the Citizen Scholarship Foundation, because I had received $1,000 worth of scholarships to Bridgewater State College when I graduated, which paid for my whole four years commuting to Bridgewater. So, so I was really well known during those times. And in 1995, our Plymouth County District Attorney, um, Bill O'Malley, died suddenly and there was a vacancy and there was an opening in a special election because Michael Sullivan, who was a state rep from um, Whitman Abington East Bridgewater at the time, was appointed to be the um, district attorney. So it was a Saturday morning, my husband and I were in Whitman Center and we bumped into Emmett Hayes who had also been a state representative for our district. And we were talking about this open seat and Emmett said to Bob, it's time to make a comeback. And I just opened my mouth and said, if anybody in this family is gonna run, it will be me. Not really thinking about it and not really even meaning. I had never thought of being a state rep, but both Bob and Emmett said, really, do you think you would run? And Bob said, you love to help people. And by um, being in the legislature, you can help millions of people. You can make policies that can improve lives. So, so I took a few months because at the time I was teaching middle school in East Bridgewater, and this was in April. So I took a couple months and by Mother's Day, I decided, yes, I would do it. And um, we ran a really strenuous campaign through a very hot, hot summer, out knocking on doors every day and meeting people and raising money and having fundraisers. It was um, really tough. So I did very well in a primary against um, three Democrats, and there was another primary with um, three Republican men, so it was all men and me. And going into the regular special election, people thought that I was a shoe in and some people who were members of my family didn't vote, they went on business trips, and I lost that special election by 75 votes. And it was tough because people had worked so hard to um, support me and you know, just my whole family had. But people were willing to work again and asked if I would run again. So again, had to think about it. But losing that election by 75 votes, and it was out of over 5,000 votes um, that had been cast. So it shows the importance of every single vote. Last spring in Whitman, a selectman and a school committee person each won their seats by six votes. And in Howich, where I live now last fall, 
a select person's race was determined by 30 votes. So our votes do count and it can make all the difference in the world in what kind of representation we have in our government. And the people not only representing us, but they have the power of the podium and the microphone and the media. And um, it, it's something that we all need to um, work on to make sure that everybody we know gets up to vote and knows who they're voting for. So I became the state rep and was going to be sworn in in January of 1997. And if you want to know the story of how I did win that regular election, if you read chapter five of my book, it will tell you all the details and some of the reasons why I didn't win. And um, you'll find out. But I did win. And then I won four elections after that. And I stayed for 10 years. But the day we were sworn in, the next order of business is to vote on a speaker. And the people who want to be speaker spend months, maybe even years, working on that position. In the past, a lot of times it went to the um, just almost naturally to the chair of Ways and Means because they had so much experience with the budget. But um, when I was elected, the year before I was elected, Tom Finneran had been elected speaker in a different way. He um, surprised the Democrats by making a deal with the Republicans, and he won with the Republican caucus and some of the Democratic caucus. But usually it goes 100% towards the um, Democrat by the Democratic caucus and 100% of the Republicans toward whoever might be the um, Republican leader who would be running for speaker. But as you know, the Democrats do outnumber the Republicans a lot in our House of Representatives and Senate. So it has gone to a Democrat for quite a while. But after the speaker is elected, the next thing he, which it has always been a he, does is put up his rules for us to vote on. And if you don't vote for the rules, then the speaker sees you as not having confidence in him. And that makes a big difference in a lot of things that have to do with your job, like where you park your car, women are very um, well taken care of and we all get to park under the state house because of safety issues. And it was really nice not to have to cross over the street from the McCormick building parking lot in the bad weather. So determines your parking space, determines your office space, the um, worst of which are in the lower basement or the fifth floor where you overlook the roof. And then there are some beautiful ones. And then there are some tiny ones that don't have any windows. So um, it also determines how much staff you have. So we all, by um, the rules, have one staff. But the speaker can assign many more staff members to you, especially if you're a committee chair. And the speaker chooses who's going to be the committee chair. And, um, that person gets you know, quite a few more aids, but other people do get more aids too. And it all de is determined by not necessarily your um, expertise in areas or how hard you're working, but by how loyal you are to the speaker as far as um, supporting his you know, issues and the way he votes and the way you um, follow in line pretty much with him. And unfortunately, it's gotten worse and worse since I was there. And, it, you know, there's always been you have to um, get go along to get along. But the um, control of power and the lack of 
of having term limits for the speakers, which I never did believe in term limits, but now I do, is an issue. So, so then we vote on the speaker. And um, I always voted for the person that was elected, except one time when um, before Sal de Macy was elected, um, I had been working with a group of reps and we were going to use a big block of votes to have a voice, but everything was determined way before we had a chance to do that. So it, it needs to be improved. So in January, the governor comes out with his budget. And when I was there, it was around $23 billion. This year's budget is 48, I believe 0.5 billion that the governor came out with. And um, then the House Ways and Means Committee budget comes out in April. And right now they're working on the budget. They might even be working on it tonight. I know they were last night, I believe. But um, that's huge because that determines all the um, bills that need money. And it, if you don't have the money to fulfill the requirements to make things happen, then it doesn't do any good to vote the bills in. So, so it takes a lot of time. And during that time, advocates and constituents and people from businesses or hospitals or whatever, want the ear of the reps to um, put things as amendments into the budget if it isn't in the budget. So my second budget, I was working with Healthcare for All and advocates who saw a need for more funding for children because the um, CHIP program didn't have it which was the children's like medical security. Then Mass Health did have um, dental coverage for children, but a lot of dentists wouldn't take it because the reimbursement was so low and they had to take all applicants who came to their office, or all patients who came to their office, if they wanted to be in the program. So there was a huge void and children weren't getting the dental health they needed and it can be so simple as having checkups and cleanings and sealants and it can prevent oral health it can cause all kinds of troubles for children adults and elderly so so that very first budget i had two amendments for oral health increase funding for children. And I went around to all of my colleagues, 160 state reps, which there still are now, and asked them to sign on to my amendment. And it was 90, I think 91, it was more than half, so more than enough to pass the amendment. And um, so it was about midnight of probably the second or third night of our budget deliberations and my amendment came up. So I stood up and I was really nervous because this would have been my first time speaking in front of the legislature. And I asked to be um, allowed to go to the podium and be recognized. And the speaker immediately gaveled the session into a recess and called me up to talk to me. And he told me all the reasons, not really the reasons, but he told me that um, Ways and Means had a lot of questions about my amendments and um, they weren't in favor of it. And I said, but you know, the facts show that children aren't getting what they needed. We talked about it for a while. And then the speaker um, asked me to speak to the Ways and Means staff who were much younger and um, very nice, but we talked for a while and I still didn't withdraw my amendment. And 
And then the speaker asked the chair of the healthcare committee to come up and talk to me. So she did. She was a person I totally respected and still do totally respect. And um, she talked to me about it and said that the speaker would really look into the matter and wanted to do something about it, but he needed more information. And um, she asked me if I would withdraw my amendment. So I did, but I found out that there's another reason that I needed to withdraw that amendment and it's called spotting your colleagues. And for the people who signed on to my amendment, if they had voted for it against the speaker's vote, which was against it, um, they would have been on the outs with the speaker. And this could have affected, if they did it enough times, how they were able to function because the speaker had so much control even about what your um, district got in money, what bills you got to pass, other special things that you might need for your district. So there were a lot of things that people um, needed the speaker's support on. And, um, but, so by voting in favor of the amendment, which they liked, their constituents would have been happy. But then to see that they voted against it, then the constituents wouldn't have been happy because they said they supported it and they had signed on to it. So um, it's a very tough situation. And to have one person have that much control over people isn't good. So, so that was one of my first little clashes with um, the leadership and learning how things really worked in the state house, not the ideal way that I expected it to be seeing that the Democrats were in the majority and we could do wonders. So, so moved on from that, but that was one of the big things that it takes, you know, weeks to go through the budget. Then you have bill signings and um, bills that you write yourself. And my very first one was a bill to make gamma hydroxybutyrate a um, controlled illegal substance because at the time this which was called the um, silent or what was it? It was a date rape drug because it's colorless and it could be slipped into somebody's drink. And but it it wasn't an Ill illegal substance. So so filing that and then getting support and stuff is part of what you do. And that um, actually worked out that it became a law, but it didn't become a law in my name. It became or with, I think, the governor promoting it, but I'm glad it passed anyway. So besides the um, budget, each of us had, as representatives, had 40,000 constituents who we were representing. And these constituents were people that would um, come to my office hours. Every Friday I met, in one of my towns at like the Village News in East Bridgewater or Emmy's Deli in Abington. And constituents were free to come in, have a cup of coffee, talk and go over their needs. And some of the people who came were nurses who wanted to improve their staffing. They were people who were trying to get licenses and because the Board of Licensure was so understaffed, it took like, a year after passing boards and different things to, to get um, licenses. Even the teachers weren't getting their licenses in time. And one of my constituents who came to my office hours was Harry Markopoulos. And you might have heard of him. He lived in Whitman right around the corner from me. And he was a financial analyst who in 2004 found that Bernie Madoff was producing numbers with his investors that weren't possible. And Harry had um, gone to the SEC, Security and Exchange Commission in um, Washington and nobody would do anything about it. 
So he came to me to ask if I could get him an appointment with Secretary of State Galvin, which I did. And Harry went in and spoke with him and his staff a couple of times. And in his book that um, Harry wrote about what happened once Bernie finally was found guilty, um, recognized that Secretary Galvin and um, the Attorney Generals in New York, Elliot Spitzler, Spitzer and Andrew Cuomo had tried to help, but it took years before anybody would do anything about it. So you know, finding these things that had been going on made me all the more want to um, tell people that they need to be involved, that because because we all know life is precious, life is fragile, while well, our democracy right now is extremely precious and extremely fragile as we see what can happen in other countries where we have autocracies and where people were talked into voting for leaders who weren't in the best interests of what they were doing. So you do um, constituent needs and don't hesitate ever to call your state rep or your senator because we have these wonderful legislative liaisons in the different departments and agencies who can look at issues constituents are having and try to fix them. Also, we need to hear from you because if there are bills that are important to you and your family, bills that might have to do with EpiPens and the cost of EpiPens that um, so many people who have allergies these days need. And if they don't have insurance, they're very expensive. And um, one of my granddaughters came down with what's called PANDAS, which is pediatric autoimmune neurological disorder something. And um, so I called my rep and senator here and, and they listen and they support things for us. And we did get something passed that insurance would cover that syndrome, which was totally new. And um, just to let you know that how much representatives make these days, um, it's $70,000 as a base salary, 16,000 added to that because of um, for to be used for expenses and travel. And then if a person is a chair of one of the joint committees, 15,000 more is added. If you're a vice chair, 6,000 is added. So they are being reimbursed well and they are there to work for you. And I um, sent an email to Robert Hayes today, which he will be sending out. And it gives the state senators and state representatives from Tewksbury. I didn't know all the different, and I probably wouldn't have had time to write one out for all the different towns. But by having a handy paper like this, you can put it on a piece of colored paper by your phone and have the phone numbers. So when you're reading something in the paper, or you get an email from an organization that you're involved with or a group of um, parents that are working on something, you'll have those phone numbers to call and reps and senators respond to constituents because they know that you are the people who are going to vote for them. And the more they hear from you, the better for you and for them so that they know what's going on. And people will be very responsive and that's how democracy works. So the more people you can get to call, the better it will be. And the more that we can get people to run for office who will stand up for transparency and dare to vote against the speakers and speak up for getting government back to the people that will work very well. So, just um, to leave on a little bit of a, um, not a little bit, but a lot of a hopeful note before we answer questions is that um, the people in the age bracket 20 to 40 is really paying attention and 
really wanting to get involved and they're out there working on everything from climate change to um, voting needs. So, so um, there's a lot of hope coming down the line. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Didn't think I would run out of time. Okay. Well, thank you, Kathleen. Oh, that was really interesting. And one thing you didn't mention that I would like to tell people is that if they would like to buy a copy of the book, the easiest way to do that is is on Amazon. Right. So uh, if you yes. have any other suggestions, we'd be glad to hear them now. Well, both of them are on Amazon. The cookie book you can also buy through SDP Publishing which is the person that I had helped me publish that book. So it's SDP publishing out of East Bridgewater. Amazon I did all the publishing through because it was the fastest and easiest way to get it published. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, we have a question from a member of our audience who is I, I think our most frequent question, question asker and that is uh, what, in your opinion, is the most transparent part of the legislative process and what is the least transparent? And by that he means specifically transparent to the public. So what do you think the public needs to see more of, if anything? Okay. Well, I'm happy to see that online you can watch sessions now, you can watch mm -hmm. hearings and you can get um, archived transcripts and stuff from those sessions. But the thing is coming out of committees, people can tell constituents that they are supporting a bill that's coming out of a committee. But when things are voted out of committees, we don't individually vote on them. You either, we're all bunched into one vote for it or against it with a few people um, disagreeing. You do have time beforehand to talk to the chair about it, but you don't know really. And that's why a lot of the bills haven't passed because they've had a lot of support, but um, leadership doesn't want them to pass. And that's the money influence that is you know, really corrupting federally mm -hmm. and statewide. It's, way, way too much money and dark money given to campaigns, billions and millions. Okay. So we have a question about the efficacy and the value of signing petitions that go to legislators. Um, the question, the person who's asking the question says that her uh, email box is always full of requests to sign petitions. So could you tell us what value signing a petition has? especially has value if people signing identify themselves as voters by where they live and um, that's will get things done and um, the numbers should make it work because people you know the reps and senators see you as the people who are going to vote them in but um, even like with things like the um, nurse staffing that has been extremely popular and petitions have signed to put it on the um, ballot to vote on, but then they, they will find um, little legalese kinds of errors in the way the wording was done. So there are so many ways to get around it, but keep signing the petitions, but even more than ever, call the rep, a uh, senator statewide or federally, and leave your number and you know, just in an email with a few clear, short things saying what you want and why, and mm -hmm. asking what their position is going to be on that and that you really want a response. So that can help more than just signing the petitions. Great, right, that's good to know, thank you. So we have a question about uh, what you think is the biggest factor that influences the way that legislators work 
the, the methods that they use. Uh, you clearly brought kindness and persistence and the ability to listen to your time in the legislature and both before and after that as well. But, and related to that is, do you think that men and women work in different ways? Yes. So the main question is, is what factors influence the, the way that legislators get their work done? Well, um, it's, it's different for each individual, mm -hmm. but um, I can tell you that the majority of people in the legislature are good people, but the system is extremely broken. And so we need people, because I know people who are working there every day who don't buck the system as much as they would like to because then their power is taken away to get even the small things they try to do done. So, um, but I, I learned that, well, I thought speaking was your most important quality and skillful speaking. And I learned that listening is the most important and that's what people yeah. want more than ever. And, I mean, you can't understand and then come to a consensus or come to a compromise unless you know all the ways things are affected by what your vote is going to do. Um, so right now, I would say a lot just um, comes down from the power and the leadership. But other than that, um, People are working really hard mm -hmm. and it just needs to change so that the ones who are working hard and the ones with the expertise are the ones who are leading what's happening. And I know it's hard because you have 160 different people and to keep things so that they will pass. So I don't know if that answered the question or not. Okay. What, well, persistence and uh, an ability to listen well, those are two things that you just illustrated. Yeah, persistence is big. Yes. <laughs> so that. of all the things that you've accomplished, both in your life so far and in your time in the legislature, what are you most proud of? Well, I'm proud of all the little ways that I helped people, my constituents, I hear from people all the time. And when I left, we threw away three giant um, recycle receptacles through, filled with constituent response questionnaires and requests. And people thank me, you know, for what I did for their mothers or what I did for this or that and um, that. And, getting like the oral health for children and adults and getting to work on that and, and the special um, commission on oral health to make some changes in Massachusetts, which have was the foundation for a lot of changes that have helped since then. But you know, just every day being able to help people and um, it's a wonderful feeling. Good. Well, as, as the custodian of your papers, I hate to hear about you throwing anything away, but um, I know that you can't keep everything and it's not, it's not all valuable historically. So do you have any recommendations for people who are interested in being, having a, a larger part of government besides just voting, uh, who, who want to get involved in government? Do you have any recommendations for the the best way that they can start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think getting to know and visit the people who are their representatives now, also um, during campaigns to find out candidates who think along the same line that you do and volunteer for their committees. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot that way. And um, also, by being involved in your community and volunteering for lots of things and getting to know people so that they know you, they know what kind of a person you are. It might be through your church too. I didn't even mention my church, but I was very involved in that. Um, 
So doing those things and you know, watching go now you can watch selectmen's meetings or select persons meetings in your own town and going to them, starting by getting appointed to different commissions or committees in your town. Um, there are a lot of women's groups that like the League of Women Voters who can help you with information. The Women's Caucus at the State House is, has a lot of information. And, so definitely Speak, need speaking it. of the of the women's caucus, could you talk about your role in founding that and what what the caucus itself does? I think many people have no idea. Um, those of us in the, who work in the building do, but uh, I think our members of our audience would be interested in hearing about the women's caucus. Yeah, it was founded, I think, by Lois Pines and some of the women early on, but I was the chair of it. We do, we get to be chairs by taking turns instead of mm -hmm. like just getting into that power and holding on to it, but we take turns and we share information with each other and we support each other. We're there to mentor the young women, not the younger, but the newer reps that come in. And it's a, um, a social. Sometimes we um, go to lunch and do different things and have speakers. But it's it's a way to um, really gain assistance in whatever you are trying to do. And I mm -hmm. think women too are more collaborative and not quite as ambitious. Um, men, lots of times put out the fires after they've happened. And there's a lot of um, destruction, like with COVID and the lack of um, preparedness. We knew when I was on the health care committee, we knew about these pandemics that were happening at different times. And we should have had things in place early on, like enough nurses and facilities, mental health. I mean, women want to prevent problems and we see what people need because we're often mm -hmm. the caregivers and stuff. So, so we do do things differently. And when I talk to people, both men and women, they all agree that we will have a better government when there are more women represented yeah. in government. Great. So our last question is um, why, why did you leave after 10 years? Mm -hmm. It was not because I didn't want to be there anymore, because I, as I said, I loved every day of it. It was because I only had one aid. And after 10 years of responding to my constituents, to the advocates, to getting involved in different things in the committees, the um, requests were starting to pile up on the floor and my one aide and I couldn't get to them. And so I just couldn't do it anymore. And, and the sad part about it was that there were people who didn't really do much. Sometimes the people just came in to vote and they had several aides and that's why I left. So it was a big issue to me and I feel bad that I left because I wish I was still there. Yeah. <laughs> the commute was kind of tough, but I loved it. Well, every single person I've ever met who knew you is, uh, and myself included, is very grateful for everything you did while you were in the State House. So thank you for that. And thank you for writing the book. I hope everyone who's here tonight will get or buy a copy and read it. It's, it's fascinating. It's a, both a personal and a universal story. So we're very grateful that you wrote that. Well, thank you. And that's what I right. did write it to make money. I wrote it as a gift to all future generations. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I hope to you. hope to see you again in the state house. Well, I'll be there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so, thank you. That would be wonderful. So Robert, do you want to close us out? Sure. So thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you to Beth. Uh, thank you all for the wonderful questions. Uh, just uh, for those who are watching live, uh, look for that email for me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, link to this recording and also a link to purchase a copy of uh, Kathleen's two books. 
Uh, I again want to thank the uh, libraries in Andover and Lowell, and most especially I want to thank the State uh, Library of Massachusetts and uh, Beth for helping put all this together. So again, thank you so much, uh, Kathleen, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Have a good night. Thank you very Robert. much. Bye-bye.